Are we ready to go? Sure. Everybody in? Yep, I think so. Okay, okay we will start now. Uh, we were talking about uh, the Buddhist movement in Malaysia and uh, Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam being a, a predominantly Mahayana country and uh, strongly influenced by uh, Buddhism in China. Uh, especially during that, uh, uh, in the night before the 1950s. Then uh, now we are moving on to another area uh, in Sri Lanka. This whole country is different from uh, from from uh, from Vietnam because uh, it is one country that is. Uh, still very uh, strongly founded on uh, Theravada Buddhism. It has very little to do with uh, Mahayana Buddhism. And it is said to be the, the home of uh, Theravada Buddhism since the time when uh, Ashoka sent his son Ahara Mahinder to, to Sri Lanka. And uh, today we say uh, the, what you call the, the the authentic Theravada Buddhism is to be found in Sri Lanka. And uh, that is also the reason why uh, many Westerners, especially from Europe, uh, went to Sri Lanka when they wanted to study Buddhism. So we, 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 we begin by looking a little bit at the early history of uh, Sri Lanka. Let's look at the early history of Sri Lanka. We are all know very well that uh, Sri Lanka uh, got its Buddhism introduced into Sri Lanka by the Arahan Mahinder, the son of uh, Asoka. After the third council, uh, which was held in the, in the kingdom of Asoka, then Asoka sent missionaries all over the world. And one of his uh, sons, Mahinder, was sent to uh, Sri Lanka. At that time, it was believed that the king of uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the, the kingdom of Anuradhapura, the king by the name of Eva Nampiyatisa, it seems uh, he already knew about, about uh, Asoka and he also knew about Arhan Mahinda, but uh, they had not met yet. So when the Arhan Mahinda came, uh, he came with a team of people of monks. Huh? He did not come alone or a small group. As I have told you uh, at the beginning, uh, that uh, by the time of the third council, the suttas were still preserved orally. That means you need a group of monks to chant the sutras. They were not in written forms. He did not come uh, carrying uh, books or, or scriptures. He came with his mom and with his uh, fellow monks uh, to do chanting. And the story had it that uh, he, he, he and his team came and stayed in the Mahintale Hills. This Mahintale Hills is today right in the middle of Sri Lanka. You look at the potato shaped Sri Lanka, right in the middle there, there's a, a Anuradhapura, ancient kingdom. and. Uh, about one hour drive from the Andarapura, you have this Mahintale Hills. And those days, uh, Mahinda and his, uh, and his cohorts, when they came over, uh, there was no custom check, no passport check, no visa check. They were already arrived in the Mahintala Hills and they were already residing there. And then one day, this King Devanampiyatisa, he was on a hunting trip. So he went with a group of monks, a group of his uh, soldiers. He went uh, on a hunting trip uh, into this Mahintale Hills. And he saw these monks in, within the hills. But they were all uh, sitting down there, meditating, very, uh, uh, what very well composed and very uh, uh, dignified. So at first, the story said that at first, King Devanampiyatisa thought these are yakas, you know, uh, yakas, uh, uh, some kind of spirit. Mm -hmm. But 
when uh, when he approached them, then the Arhan Mahinder told the king, no, we are not spirits. We are monks from Sri Lanka. And, uh, and introduced themselves. Then so King Dagwanampiya was very happy and he, he uh, listened to his uh, Mahinder's uh, Dharma lectures. Thereafter, he uh, invited them to the palace and uh, began to accept, embrace uh, Buddhism. Then, after a, after a short while, some of the uh, women in uh, Sri Lanka, in Anuradhapura, also wish to be, uh, to be ordained as nuns, but they were no nuns. So, uh, Arhan Mahinda sent message back to his father, uh, to beg uh, his father to send uh, a group of nuns so that the uh, ordination of nuns could be done in Sri Lanka. So, was sent uh, Mahinda's sister, Sangamitta. So, it seems that Sangamitta arrived in the Sri Lanka sometimes in the, in around the, uh, in December of, of the year, you know. So, we say Sangamitta is like uh, Santa Claus that uh, brought uh, Pinky froze. So that body tree plant was now is now uh, planted in the in the Anuradhapura area, and uh, it is considered uh, a descendant of the tree from Purudaya. Uh, but actually, uh, according to records, the the, the body tree in the in Burgaya, uh, during Asoka's time, had been chopped down by uh, Asoka's uh, jealous wife, who, who was not happy that Asoka spent more time in Burgaya than with her. So she chopped down that, 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 that tree. So the tree was replanted. So whether it was the original tree under which the Buddha gained enlightenment or not, we do not know. But, uh, Buddhists normally take it for granted that it is the, from the same Bodhi tree that 2,500 years ago the Buddha sat under and gained enlightenment. And then, therefore, Buddhism entered into Sri Lanka with the Bikun order and the Bikuni order uh, into Sri Lanka. And then, from then on, uh, Buddhism in Sri Lanka went through a period of ups and downs. Uh, with king supporting and sometimes uh, came down sometimes came up but we are not going to go into all these uh, details but suffice to say that there was a very significant event that happened in the first century AD at the fourth council according to the Theravada tradition was held in the Aloka Vihara Aloka Vihara near Mantale during the king the reign of King Vattagamini Abhaya around the uh, first century BC. Okay. Uh, Venerable it was chaired by Venerable Rakita and committed the entire Buddhist canon and the commentaries to writing. So the Buddhist scriptures, uh, according to record, was uh, first put into writing only around the first century AD. Only around the first century AD. So this timely action of the Sinhalese king helped to preserve the original Buddhist canon up till today. And therefore, many scholars would like to uh, come to Sri Lanka in order to know more about the Theravada Buddhism. Then, as I said, we went through a period of up and down. And by the time of uh, 1505, uh, Colombo came to Sri Lanka with his army and so on. So, the, according to the uh, 
the Lanka Chronicle, as well as the records of their friendly historian, they describe the Portuguese as cruel, inhuman, rapacious, bigoted, and selfish prosecutors of Buddhism in their endeavor to impose their faith on the Roman Catholicism on the people of Sri Lanka. And uh, they use method of either inducement or punishment. If you don't convert, you'll be punished. But if you uh, convert, uh, you will be able to do to, to trade with the with the Portuguese. So it is this is not surprising if you go back to history, you will notice that uh, uh, Portugal and uh, Spain uh, during that time was uh, very strong uh, about uh, Roman Catholicism and they not only uh, suppressed Buddhism in Sri Lanka but all other faiths uh, in Portugal and Spain as well. So that's why we have this uh, called the Spanish Inquisition. So there are very clear accounts of men thrown into rivers to be eaten by crocodiles. Babies spitted on the soldiers' pipes and held up before their parents or crushed. So in all this certain thing I can't come on this, I can't see also. Okay. So it was a description of how the, the, the Buddhists were were what they call were tortured uh, or prosecuted very badly uh, during the uh, Portuguese uh, occupation. Then those who dare to worship in public or wear the yellow robe were put to death. And Buddhist monasteries and institutions were destroyed and their treasures looted. Libraries were set on fire. Thus did the period of Portuguese rule become one of the darkest period of Buddhism in Sri Lanka. So actually, that's why I said uh, Buddhism in Sri Lanka went through a period of up and down, especially during the Portuguese uh, occupation period. Uh, they suffered quite a lot and the uh, Buddhist population dwindled. Then came the Dutch rule, the Dutch king. The Dutch came about 100 over years later, about it's from 1658, and the Dutch ruled until 1796. The Dutch were Protestants, and so they came. And the Dutch established systems of church come school throughout their territories. The schoolmaster was both teacher and representative of the religion. Now, this is not surprising because uh, uh, even in the Europe, uh, uh, the church uh, acted as schools. The church provided education. So when they came over here, the church or the church father uh, was also the school headmaster. And the school is also within the church. So services were held regularly at these places and birth and marriages were registered according to the Christian rights. And all civil rights and inheritance depended on a person's church affiliations. So if you are not affiliated to any particular church, then your inheritance uh, would be a problem and your civil rights would be, would be challenged. So during the Dutch rule, no person who was not a Christian could hold even a minor office under the government. So in order to become a government servant or just a usually clerk in the government office, have to be converted to Christian. Another thing is no person who was not a Christian could get married legally or assisted the birth of a child. So since most people would have to eventually get married or to bear a child or to, to get the child registered so that eventually would enter school. So indirectly, uh, they were forced to convert. Then 1976, the British came. When the British came in 1976, uh, actually until then, uh, from Portuguese, uh, Portuguese to Dutch to British, uh, not every part of Sri Lanka were, were, was colonized, not every part. So when the British came, the, the British occupied most of the coastal area of Sri Lanka. 
but eventually they they colonized the whole kingdom by the 1815 1815 approximately 200 years from now uh, they colonized the whole island after uh, uh, signing a treaty uh, in, we call it the candy treaty with uh, all the candy chiefs and handed over the country to the British with the condition that the British promised to safeguard Buddhism and declaring its rites and ceremonies sacred and inviolate. This part is very is an interesting part because the candy chiefs finally agreed to surrender the authority of ruling their own areas to the British in exchange for the British to uh, to protect Buddhism. And this is something today we call it a you know a, a, a theological state where the, the politics and the religions are mixed together. But the British were not Buddhist. So this is a very strange arrangement whereby uh, the, polit the, the politics, political forces or the government forces was asked to, to protect Buddhism. So in a way, uh, Buddhism actually surrendered part of its autonomous power to the British. But under the British rule, it was much better, situation was better. But even as late as 1805, no child could be legally registered without previously baptized by a Christian minister. And the clergy did not solemnize the marriage of unbaptized individuals. So, you know, indirectly, there's a, a way of uh, compelling people uh, to get baptized or to become uh, Christians. So even as late as 1805, no child could be legally registered without previously being baptized by a Christian minister, and the clergy would not solemnize marriage of unbaptized individuals. Furthermore, only those who adopted the Christian faith were favored with government employment. And this is this attitude of the British make vast number of Buddhists adopt the new faith without any understanding of its teachings. The, 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 the British rulers gave all possible support to the Christian missionary to carry up their educational and missionary activities. Then, with these Christianizations that had gone on with the preference, preference, preferential treatments given to the to Christians in an effort to get more Christian, Christians, so uh, there were also Christianization through missionary schools, and they were actually very active missionaries. And unfortunately, these active missionaries would uh, uh, condemn, criticize, radical Buddhism. So, uh, such criticisms, uh, even, even uh, just 20, 30 years ago in my country, we could still see a lot of our Christian missionaries uh, condemning uh, Buddhism as uh, tree worshippers because Buddhists, Buddhists uh, go to the Bodhi trees. And uh, so we are tree worship. We were condemned as uh, tree worshippers. And uh, because we pray to Buddha images, so we were condemned as uh, idol worshippers. So uh, uh, such uh, such uh, uh, ridicules were always thrown on the Buddhists, so much so that uh, Buddhists, uh, especially the educated Buddhists, educated in the sense of uh, receiving good education, secular education, but not uh, well informed about Buddhism, uh, felt, uh, felt rather discouraged or felt rather uh, ashamed to be a uh, associated with the Buddhism. So some of them would eventually uh, opt to join the Christianity, uh, something which is uh, which was uh, seen to as uh, more progressive, more modern, and the Buddhism was uh, degraded into as something uh, superstitious. And this thing went on and on, in, especially in Sri Lanka at that time. So about 1860, a young Buddhist Samanera by the name of Muhatiwate Gunananda, he 
appear on the scene and challenge the Christian missionary to meet him in open debate. So then came in history, uh, the, we call it the Great Buddhist Christian Debate. Uh, three public debates, one at Udanpita in 1866, another one at Gompala 1871, and the last one at Panadura in 1873. And if you consider those written, written debates through the newspapers, then altogether there were five uh, debates. But let's, let's just take the three uh, verbal debates, uh, 1816, 1866, 1871, and 1873. By the time 1873, that young novice is no longer a novice, um, he, he became a monk, a full fresh monk. I mean. So, in 1873, there was much reading of Buddhism through books and pamphlets written in the vernaculars, which Christians distributed in promoting their faith. This was beside the mass proselytizing of Buddhists. The specific reason for the debate in Pondura in 1873 were the publication by one Reverend Daniel Colgatory and a series of sermons denouncing Buddhism uh, preached by Reverend David Isilva in the Honodura Methodist Church. And the Venerable Migatuate Kundananda, a robust spokesman for Buddhism, took exception to the sermons and challenged Isilva to defend his remarks. So there was a big debate. Both sides spoke. At the conclusion of the dispute, at the at the conclusion of the debate, the crowd claimed Gunananda and Buddhism claimed victory. And, uh, and in fact, the Buddhists uh, felt so happy with the, with the debate that they won. They actually carried uh, Gunananda on the soldiers and uh, with a big uh, band to send him off to the nearest railway station to return to Colombo. So there were big celebrations, and uh, in fact, there were met subsequently many other celebrations in many other temples uh, uh, throughout the country. Now, so this was in fact a, a, a statue uh, that was elected, uh, built by devotees at the place of the debate in Ponodura, uh, with his hand pointing uh, to the to the Methodist church there. Now, why we say that, uh, uh, I mean, now let's say, look at the description of that great debate. Uh, the director of the National Archive, uh, Mr. KDG Wimaratana, he said, Reverend De Silva, uh, a fluent speaker in Pali and Sanskrit. If I'm not mistaken, this Reverend De Silva was a, was a, was a, was a Buddhist. From the beginning, he was a Buddhist. Then he, he, he converted himself. Then Reverend De Siva, a fluent speaker in Pali and Sanskrit, addressed the audience of around 6,000 to 7,000 people, but only a very few understood him. In complete contrast was Mohatiwate Gunananda, who used plain language to counter the arguments of his opponents. And then we have uh, Vijaya Samarawira in his article. Article he wrote in his article, the government and religion problems and policies of uh, 1832 to 1910. He stated that the Reverend Kunananda proved himself to be a debater of a very high order, metasem, witty, and eloquent, if not especially erudite. The emotions generated by this debate and the impact of uh, Unananda's personality and lasting effects on the next generation of Buddhist activities. So, Megatuate's Unananda's triumph at uh, Onurara set the field on a de decade of quiet recovery of Buddhist confidence. So, later, the establishment of the Society for the Propagation of Buddhism in Kotahina and the Lanka Prakara Press and Gala would seem to mark the first positive phase in his, his, his discovery. Another Christian missionary, 
Reverend S. London, like that, who was present when Munananda spoke in the Panora debate, he actually uh, he remarked that there is that in his manner as he rises to speak, which puts one in mind of some orators at home. He shows a consciousness of power with the people. His voice is of great compass and has a clear ring above it. His action is good and the long yellow rope thrown over one shoulder helps to make it impressive. His power of persuasion so seems to be a born orator. By the way, I associated with a lot of uh, Sri Lankans, especially the singerists, and I think all of them are very good speakers. The Methodist account of the incident differed a little bit. The Methodist not so uh, inclined to say that uh, the debate was won by the British. Uh, he said the result of the debate were from the nature of the case inconclusive. Instead of saying conclusive, he says inconclusive. It was considered that the, the Buddhists had put the Christians on the defense, defensive, but the Christians had got the opportunity to clearly present the gospel to many thousands of Buddhists. And this is obvious. Because the Christians were still considered minority, so when you have a lot of Buddhists for you to talk to, so in that sense, you won. Even though uh, the Buddhists uh, had put the Christians on the defensive, but the Christians had the opportunity to speak to a large group of Buddhists. But the net result was very small, except that relations were more strained than ever. The Christian church continued to grow, uh, but not as a result of controversy. No doubt, the Christian church continued to grow. That uh, we do not deny. Then we have Colonel Ocott. Colonel Ocott, later he described the most brilliant polemic orator of the land. The terror of the missionaries with a very intellectual head, most brilliant and powerful champion of the Singhalese Buddhism. So, I would like to show you the impact of this debate, why I talk quite a bit about this debate. The, this, this debate had a very great in, impact to Sri Lankan Buddhism and in fact to the whole of Sri Lanka. That the debate had significance is confirmed in the publication of English translation of the sermons in the times of Salon as the event unfolded. The publication in book form of a small account of the debate and the sermons that year and the subsequent reprinting of this over the next 150 years. So the debate was translated into English, uh, published in the times of Salon, and later on was... Uh, Recompiled and published as a book called uh, Buddhism and Christianity Face to Face. You can Google and you still can read this book uh, in the internet. Uh, Buddhism and Christianity Face to Face. Face to Face. Otherwise, this book had been since 1873 uh, been uh, reprinted over and over. And at that time, there was one Reverend A. G. Fraser who tried. The Christian reverend would try to stop the publication of this book, and this by itself is an indication that the Christians have lost the debate. And the fact that the Buddhists have won the debate at a time when the Salonic society was unable to challenge the political and military dominance of the British, help the military dominance the British had on the island, Buddhism was able to successfully. Uh, Challenge Christianity. The defeat of Christianity in this encounter heralded the resurgence of Salonist nationalism and eventual independence in 1948. This debate is of great significance because it has got that kind of a butterfly effect. Uh, locally, it, it gave the, uh, the local uh, Salonist society uh, a sense of uh, victory, success. Since we can't win, uh, we can't win uh, with uh, the British in terms of politics and uh, military. At least we win them uh, in the debate. So they feel a sense of uh, confidence and pride. So I would like to mention about the butterfly effect. The editor of Salon Time 
John Cooper arranged for Edward Ferreira published. And this translation was published as a book, Buddhism and Christianity Face to Face by J.M. Peebles, a scholar who happened to be in Sri Lanka at the time of the debate in the United States with an introduction in 1878. Okay. So that was a little bit later already. This is a copy of the book. You still can find that in the internet. This uh, white bearded man is Colonel Accord, an American Colonel. He was a Colonel during the North, North South Civil War in USA. So after reading a copy of the book in the library, in a public library, or some people say JM people sent him a copy, Henry Steel Accord, he was then the president of the Theosophical Society, came to Sri Lanka on the 17th of May, 1880. And with his uh, arrival, the activities of the Reformation gained traction. Uh, being the president of Theosophical Society, he was exposed to all religions and he had uh, read most of the uh, books on the religions, so Buddhism included. But after reading this uh, book on Buddhism face to face, uh, he felt a strong sense that he should come to Sri Lanka uh, to, learn, to learn more about Buddhism. But he already made up his mind. In fact, he already became a Buddhist, but he made up his mind that he would like to come over to, uh, to Sri Lanka. To be officially ordained as a to be, on 17 May 1880, he came over to Sri Lanka by ship. Those days, aeroplanes I think have not emerged yet. No aeroplane. So he came by ship. He arrived at the port, and uh, according to his own descriptions, the Sri Lankans actually welcomed him like a hero for, for whatever reason. They welcomed him like a hero. And uh, they lay a uh, white cross from the from one end of the port right to the horse carriage, which was supposed to carry him, and uh, with a with with a bank of uh, dancers to welcome him. And uh, two days later, 19 of May, he he he, uh, he took the ordination as a lay Buddhist by observing the by taking taking the three refuges and the five precepts. He officially declared himself as a Buddhist. And his arrival is of great significance because this man did a lot to, uh, to promote Buddhism in Sri Lanka. He proposed, the establish, he proposed the establishment of Buddhist schools throughout his Buddhist Theosophical Society. So in 1880, they built three schools. By the time 1897, there were 25 boys schools and 11 girls schools and pick and pan co-educational schools. And by 1974, schools with 30,000 students and 1940, 429 schools. So if you talk about engaged Buddhism, uh, socially engaged, uh, of course, uh, did very well in the sense of uh, providing education. The Theosophical Society also started the Sinhalese newspaper in December 1880 and later its English supplement, the Buddhist, and now a monthly of the Young Men Buddhist Association of, of Sri Lanka of Colombo. And as a result of Colonel Okos' effort, Buddhists of Sri Lanka gained freedom to hold their Buddhist procession. And that the full moon day of Visa was declared a public holiday in 1880. Sometimes uh, in late 1884 or early 1885, uh, Colonel Ocott got an authorization from all the chapters, all the chief monks of all the chapters in Sri Lanka. They gave him an authorization letter, the full authority to go to London, uh, the colonial office to petition the government 
to declare visa a holiday. So they gave him full authority to negotiate with the British government on their behalf. So he set sail to London and negotiated, and he was successful. So 1885, Sri Lanka visa public holiday came back again. Now in the early days, when uh, when we were society was not industrialized, people do not really bother so much about whether it's public holiday or not public holidays. If you are looking at the crops, you are looking after your plants, public holidays or not public holidays, you still have to water them. But in an industrialized society, public holidays become the uh, uh, extra privilege. And if in the early days, the Buddhists had always been celebrating Visa with or without uh, it as a public holiday. Another achievement of Connor or Court was in a uh, uh, they decided to design a Buddhist flag. So this was the, this, the Buddhist flag. So some people say that Colonel Occult designed the Buddhist flag. Uh, no, he did not design the Buddhist flag. It was designed by a team of designers. And he was, uh, he was a head of a committee that uh, oversees this uh, project. So that was how the Buddhist flag came about. And this Buddhist flag subsequently uh, up since 1885 was well, was popularly used in Sri Lanka, and in uh, 1950, with the formation of the World Fellowship of Buddhists, it was uh, unanimously accepted at the World Fellowship of Buddhist Conference to accept this flag as a uh, as an international Buddhist flag. So that's how this flag now becomes a. A, a, a symbol of Buddhism. And he also lobbied for the appointment of Buddhist registrar of marriages. Otherwise, uh, previous before that, registrar of marriages were Christian. And because of Occult, that was uh, one of his uh, greatest contributions. Uh, but we need to know another person, Anagarika Dhammapala. Anagarika is an honorary figure. Uh, it, it, it means uh, the, like uh, 10 preceptors. Okay? His full name is Dhammapala. So when Colonel Okot and, Mad and Madam Balasti arrived in Lanka, Madam Balasti is another uh, Theosophical Society's uh, leader. So they, he came, she, she came together with uh, Colonel Okot. When they arrived in Sri Lanka in 1880, Dhammapala was then only 16 years old and, uh, and became the favorite of the, through the two foreigners through his uh, association with uh, Gunananda Thera. So this, this is uh, Dhammapala uh, who was associated with Gunananda and uh, later he became a translator for Colonel Okot. So he now traveled throughout the country with or without his companion or court. So those were the days when the Buddhists of Sri Lanka were reluctant to declare themselves Buddhists, for Buddhism was considered to be the faith of the unurbanized masses. By the way, that was also the same situation in Malaysia, probably about 30, 40 years back. Uh, very few educated people or urban people would like to be called Buddhist. Of course, today the situation has changed. It was the fashion at that time to become a Christian, to study English and other allied subjects, and to adopt a foreign name, and to imitate the dress of the foreigners and their customs and manners. Buddhism and Buddhist culture were subjected to ridicule and were the heritage of the villagers in the interior. So, Colonel Occult was against this. He tried to bring back the pride of the. Uh, uh, that's why eh, you look at the Colonel Occult's uh, dress, even as a layman, he, he normally wear like a rope, rope like things on the, the, of the Sri Lankan people, not 
the Western dress. I was the foremost among those who rose against this mentality of the British. British through his public speeches and numerous articles in newspapers and journals, he vehemently opposed the habit of imitating, imitating foreigners in religion, names, and custom and custom. He emphatically pointed out this tendency to imitate was a clear manifestation of a lack of the primary element of self-esteem. So, in fact, Anagarika Dhammapala uh, is recorded as one of the uh, uh, independence heroes of Sri Lanka. So, in keeping with his preaching, he himself changed his name from David to Dhammapala. By the way, because of the Portuguese influence, uh, so many people adopted Portuguese names. So you go, if you go to Sri Lanka, you, everywhere you turn, you will find a uh, Perela or Jisiva, <laughs> and uh, later you find uh, when with the arrival of the British, you find other other uh, Christian names like uh, David, uh, uh, Alfred, and so on. And uh, he changed his name from David to Dhammapala to signify. Even that's why today, if if you come across you you can come across a lot of Sri Lankans still carrying Christian names, but they are not necessarily Christians. They are not necessarily Christians. And I have a friend here in Kuala Lumpur. His name was Alfred. He also changed his name to Ananda. The people listened to his sermon and read his articles in journals. And newspapers and were convinced of the truth of his philosophy. So gradually they came about a cultural revival. The people began to take pride in their religion, their language, and their customs. So arising from this uh, Ponarura debate, the Sinhalese especially brought back their confidence and their self-esteem. And then the, with, with the butterfly effect bringing brought about a, a sense of a revival in the sense of revival in Sri Lanka. But uh, just a point to note that the Dhammapala eventually broke with Occult and the Theosophical Society because of Occult's stance on universal religion. Because Theosophical Society talk about theology and, so and philosophy. And they would, they would, in all likelihood, accept all religions. So one of the important factors in these rejections was on the university of universalism. The uni Buddhism being assimilated into a non-Buddhist model of truth was ultimately too high for Dhammapala. Okay. If you look at the last sentence. Dhammapala says, to say that all religions have a common foundation only shows the ignorance of the speaker. Dharma alone is supreme to the Buddhist. You know, nowadays, a lot of people like to say, well, all religions are the same. But actually, I don't agree. If all religions are the same, then, then we, wouldn't be have, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have so many religions. All religions are different in one way or another. The Mahabodhi Society at Kuala Lumpur, Anagarika Dhammapala founded the Mahabodhi Society at Kuala Lumpur in 1891 and then eventually moved the society, moved to the headquarters to Calcutta. This society in the 1800, end of 1800, right until the beginning of 1900, was actually a very powerful society that I came to realize quite recently because I, when I went through the literature, I, when I researched through some of the early Buddhist uh, leaders in Malaysia, I, I realized that they were members of this Mahabodhi society. Uh, those leaders who were involved in uh, asking for a visa as a public holiday in Malaysia, way back in 1948-99, uh, some of them were members of the Mahabodhi society. So that showed that uh, uh, Sri Lankan influence uh, was quite great at that time. And Anagarika Dhammapala's 
one of his primary objective was the restoration of the Buddhist control of the Mahabodhi temple at Murakaya. Ladies and gentlemen, there is something very strange here. The Mahabodhi temple at Murakaya, the place where the Buddha gained enlightenment, after so many years of neglect, the temple actually fell into the hands of Hindus. So, a group of Hindus actually controlled this temple. And something is not right, isn't it? A Buddhist holy site is in the control of another religion. So, Dharmapala initiated a lawsuit against the Brahmin priest who had held control of the site for centuries. And after a protracted struggle, this was successfully only after India's independence in 1947, 16 years after Dhammapala's own death in 1933. So in, 1940, uh, in 1949, the banishment of the Mahabodhi so the, the banishment of the, tem the temple, of the Bodhagaya temple, uh, finally we say partially restored to the Buddhist. Why partially restored? Out of the four major uh, so-called trustees ma ma uh, managing the temple, two are still Hindus, two are Buddhists. So this is a very strange arrangement. Uh, but then uh, we also can see the, uh, uh, the magnanimous uh, attitude of the Buddhists uh, willing to let this uh, most holy site, Burkaya, uh, to be shared with the, with the, uh, with, with the Hindus. With the Hindu. uh, well, we must also understand that now Mahabodhi is a great source of income uh, to whoever manages it. Of course, the maintenance of that place is also very big, but with the number of pilgrims going there every year, uh, it, it can be a great source of income. But what is more important is that this Buddhist holy site sh should be managed by the Buddhists. But uh, because of historical reasons, uh, Buddhists could only get back half of it. So this is the Mahabodhi, Mahabodhi temple before, this, was, this is sometime in 18 something, before its restoration. It was there, but it was in terrible shape. This is after its restoration. So now it's much better. And if, in fact, at night when it's lighted up, it's like a fairy land now. So Mahabodhi Society centers were set up in many Indian cities. So we look at Anagarika Dhammapala's major contributions. Number one, restoration of Mahabodhi, I've mentioned to you just now. Number two, restoration of Sarna. There's another place, a temple in Sarna. Then the International Buddhist Movement for Sarna. I let you see, let you see the temple. 1871, this is Tarnak Stupa. And uh, this was the restoration later. But uh, there were many other temples in Sarna, not only one. Okay, not only the one stupa, but many. So, if we list now his contribution, he restored the Mahabodhi, restored Sarna, and then the, he began his uh, international Buddhist movement. So, he, he was in fact uh, uh, slightly earlier than the Tai Chi uh, because he visited, uh, but it's about the same time as uh, Aoyang, uh, this uh, uh, Yang Wenhui. So, he visited England four times, United States six times, and then he visited China, Japan, and Thailand. He was, in China, in Shanghai, he met Yang Wenhui. And then France and Italy on road on his journey to England and America. During his visit to England and America, he secured available financial support and established a Buddhist center in London in 1926. So that was about one of the earliest to establish a, a Buddhist center in London. Another thing is, one of his uh, successors, 
uh, Professor G.P. Malala Sekra, who founded, who was one of the founders of the World Fellowship of Buddhists in 1950. Professor Malala Sekra uh, also said to be a, 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 a revivalist a Buddhist leader. His major con uh, Anagarika Dhammapala was like, a, like, his, like his mentor. And Anagarika Dhammapala uh, conduct uh, enable mass conversion of the Dalits earlier than Ambedkar by 50 years. So Ambedkar is well known for his mass conversion of Dalits, more than 380,000 people at one time. But uh, actually 50 years earlier than him, Anagarika Dhammapala already did that in, uh, in India. And Dhammapala popularized Buddhist education not only locally but also internationally and bring cultural pride back to the Sinhalese and laid the foundation for Buddhist nationalism. We will go on to the next one is on Buddhist Pirivena because before the great debates, Buddhist Renaissance already started. Some people thought, well, it's because of uh, Colonel Occult that uh, Buddhism revived. Uh, no, actually much earlier, uh, revival movement started even earlier than that. And that was started with, by many monks. But I think we were hot here for the time being. Then uh, we go on to Buddhist Pirivena after our 15 minutes break. Okay. All right, sounds good. All right. Yeah. Are we ready to go? Uh, sure. Okay. I think so. Okay, we were talking about uh, revival of uh, Buddhism in Sri Lanka, uh, especially during the, uh, the British period, the, uh, which uh, sparked off by the Panorama uh, debates in the 1870s. Then, the, so that uh, that was the, the spark that uh, gave rise to we call it a Sinhalese nationalism. But uh, actually, the Buddhist revival started much earlier than that. Uh, so before the great debate, the Buddhist renaissance already started. So way back in 1839, Reverend Warane Siddhartha had established the Paramadhamma Chetteya Pirivena. Pirivena uh, means like a Buddhist institute or a Buddhist college. Okay? It signifies the beginning of Buddhist reformation. Uh, Pirivena or Buddhist colleges actually existed since the second century AD, but gradually replaced by missionary schools since the, uh, 17th, uh, the 16th uh, century. In 1873, we have this uh, venerable Ikadwe Sri Sumangala uh, who established the video diary Pirivena, which uh, follow following the success of the Panorama debate. And then you have another famous monk who established the, uh, the Vidya Lankara Pirivena. Uh, this monk by the name of Ramalande Sri Damaloka, he established the Vidya Lankara Pirvena. This uh, Vidya Lankara Pirvena uh, is well known uh, to produce, produce a number of uh, well known Buddhist scholars. Uh, one of them would be uh, Venerable Kesri Damananda, Venerable Kesri Damananda, who came over in, to, in Malaysia came over to Malaysia in 1952 and uh, he became the chief uh, chief uh, relate on the chief monk of uh, Malaysia and Singapore uh, since 1963 and he wrote uh, quite a number of uh, books articles and uh, had great influence in Malaysia and then you have this uh, venerable Wapolo Rapula uh, who is a very well-known uh, international Buddhist scholar 
uh, Venerable Wapolo Rapula. Later, I will introduce you further. Uh, okay, later, I will introduce you. Okay. Talking about the Pirivena, the Chinese monk, Pilgrim Fasien, three, three, uh, he arrived. He uh, he arrived in the uh, in the in India around three nine nine. So and uh, therefore he would be in Sri Lanka around four hundred something. He states in his uh, travel log that he visited the first Pirivena of Sri Lanka, the Mahavihara and Abhayagiri Vihara within the kingdom of Anuradhapura and indicates that they housed around 3,000 to 5,000 Buddhist monks. Uh, 3,000 and 5,000 Buddhist monks. This fact notwithstanding, Piribena is primarily regarded as a traditional, as a tradition of education that is esteemed for its qualities, its contribution to society and historical value. So if, if you look at this, uh, around the 400, 480 uh, in Sri Lanka, you have this very outstanding uh, Buddhist uh, institution, very much like what we see in, in Narada in the 600. The syllabus for both monastics and lay people was originally separated into two streams. One is the Sutta, Sutta uh, hearing. The Sutta part included subjects such as languages, religions, philosophy, history, economics, and geography. For the Sipa, Sipa means skill. When you chant the Mangala Sutta, you, you, you chant the Bahusachancha, Bahu Sipancha, Sipa, Sipa means uh, skills. Sipa included skills such as agriculture, astrology, and carpentry. The system remained highly standardized and methodical and was sought by visiting scholars from countries like Thailand, Cambodia, and Burma, even as recently as the 15th century. So Sri Lanka uh, was really a home to the uh, Buddhist and uh, to the Theravada Buddhism because the place the monks from uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Burma came over here to study also. And at present, it is reported that there are 794 Pirivenas on the island, serving student community of approximately 62,000 people. <clears throat> so now, we would like to do an overall analysis on the uh, on the Buddhist uh, movement in Sri Lanka. Now, the humanistic Buddhism that was promoted by Tai Chi in China. Humanistic Buddhism was promoted by Tai Chi in, Ch by, by tai Chi in China, in Chinese Buddhism, mainly as a response to the decaying state of Buddhism in China then. Okay. But in Sri Lanka, uh, no specific slogan such as humanistic Buddhism was used. So in, in Sri Lanka, while they established uh, while well, all this uh, movement that was going on, and no spe specific slogan like what was uh, uh, advocated by Tai Chi or Ying Sun in China, where they use a, a, a sort of a slogan uh, under the name of, of humanistic Buddhism. But in Sri Lanka, no such specific slogan. Perhaps this is my observation. The internal strength of Sri Lankan Buddhism was strong enough to bring about its own rejuvenation without much internal changes. There is no need to shout about what to change with the religion or what are the emphasis we need to do about our religions. All that we need to do is just to, to bring about the changes. Uh, so this is a little bit different from the situation in China. Uh, perhaps uh, corrupted by the uh, decay elements, so they needed to, to shout out a slogan called humanistic Buddhism uh, to champion the, their objectives. But whereas in Sri Lanka, uh, I think the traditional Theravada Buddhism as a whole 
uh, is powerful enough, is good enough uh, to bring about changes by itself. So Professor Obey Sekra, he said the influences of Christianity, especially of the Protestant Christianity, were powerful enough to create another form of Buddhism which became important for the survival of Buddhism in Sri Lanka. So he, uh, this term Protestant Buddhism in Sri Lanka uh, was not a slogan used by the Buddhist revivalists. It is a term used by scholars who make the observations and then they describe it. Okay, they describe it. They use, they call, uh, this professor, Obeya Sikra, said this form of Buddhism that uh, happened in Sri Lanka around 1850 onwards, it is uh, called uh, Protestant Buddhism. So, he, for example, uh, he said that the, Bud uh, the Buddhists uh, follow many things of what the Christians do. The Christians' influence was powerful enough that the Buddhists have to follow and that becomes another form of Buddhism. So, for example, the Christians build schools, the Buddhists also build schools, and carol singing during Visa. It is said that carol singing during Visa was introduced by Colonel O'Connor. Uh, so uh, during Visa, Buddhists also began to began to sing uh, hymns, Buddhist hymns. So uh, even until quite lately, even the 1970s, in my temple in Kuala Lumpur, Sri Lankan temple, uh, there was still some very old uh, conservative. Uh, Buddhists, especially the Sinhalese Buddhists, who were against uh, hymn singing in the temple. They say you want to sing, you go and sing outside in the temple. No, no singing. So that was the kind of uh, of uh, thinking among some of the old people. But because the Christians were so used to make the places of worship very cheerful through their uh, what do you call their uh, the songs and hymns. So the Buddhists, uh, especially uh, the Buddhists from the West, would introduce these kind of activities. And Buddhists uh, slowly uh, uh, adapted this uh, carol singing. So now in Malaysia, uh, not, we not only do carol singing during Visa, in fact, we do very little during Visa, but Visa is usually so very ex busy that. Uh, People have no time to go around carol singing, but we do so during Chinese New Year. So during Chinese New Year, young young Buddhists will go from house to house to do carol singing, and it's also a good time to collect ang pao, you know, red packets from uh, Chinese families. Uh, Chinese are very uh, used, uh, known to be very generous with ang pao or red packets uh, to be given away to especially children uh, during Chinese New Year. And then the chanting of the Basantara Jatakaya in the funeral houses. So some kind of chanting during houses. Then Buddhist Sunday schools. According to Obeya Sikra, Buddhists began to run Sunday school. And in fact, we, we, we still use the name Sunday schools. Uh, but in Malaysia, in some states, our public holiday is not on Sunday. So our public holiday, some in some states, are on uh, Friday, Muslim Muslim prayer day. Then the so it's not a Buddhist Sunday school, Buddhist Friday school. So it becomes too confusing. So we just put Buddhist Dharma school. Okay, not by the day, but Dharma. So, but from here we know uh, these uh, Buddhist Sunday schools uh, in all likelihood was what the Buddhists uh, learned uh, from the Christians and uh, adopted it into Buddhism. And to read scriptures during services rather than just uh, the conventional rites and rituals. 
So the third Protestant Buddhism, coined by this uh, Professor Kutana Pompeye Sekla, is often applied to Dhammapala's form of Buddhism. He said that it is Protestant in two ways. Number one, it is influenced by Protestant ideas such as freedom from religious institutions, freedom of conscience, and focus on individual interior experience. This is referring to the Protestant ideals as happened in the uh, Catholic Church. But it is also Protestant in the sense that it is itself a protest against claims of Christian superiority, colonialism, and Christian missionary work aimed at weakening Buddhism. So it is Protestant. So he coined the word Protestant Buddhism. But if, if uh, a Thai Shi were to look at it, it would say, well, humanistic Buddhism. The salient characteristics is that it assigns importance to the latest. So it, ar it aroused among the new literate middle class uh, centered in Kuala Lumpur. It uh, attracted a lot of uh, new and literate middle class people in Kuala Lumpur. My observation, in Sri Lanka, the reformists were, or the libraries were, Western educated, spoke English, and adapted to Western missionary methods, and adopted, adapted Western missionary methods to Buddhism easily. Uh, but the reformists in China, while having uh, external exposure, were less adaptive to Western way. Uh, similarly, you see in Malaysia, we have Reverend uh, or we call it Father Sumangalo, uh, who came over from, to Malaysia, an American. Uh, he introduced uh, the Western ways. He, in fact, he introduced the, we call it the youth circles. He introduced uh, hymn singing. Uh, he introduced uh, uh, a few other things into into Malaysian Buddhism, uh, maybe perhaps because of his uh, his Christian uh, back background, and he uh, Sumakala was preaching in English to a group of uh, English speaking Chinese, so that makes it much easier. Now, we want to look at some of the recent events. Now, now we look at this man, this monk. Uh, Venerable Dr. Rahula, who also lived until 90 years old, is a very uh, outstanding uh, Buddhist monk. Uh, he could speak English and French, and uh, he was a, a professor supervising PhD students uh, studying Buddhism. PhD students studying Buddhism in uh, England, uh, they have invited him, Wapolo Rahula, to be the examiner. So you, under, you can understand uh, uh, well, how well established uh, he is. And this monk, he is the author of this book. The Heritage of the Bhikkhus. You can go and buy this book if you are interested. The Heritage of the Bhikkhus in 1946. Why I want to why I want to talk to you about this heritage of the bhikkhus is this book is said to lay the foundation of political Buddhism in Sri Lanka. Wapola Rahula. Uh, argue in his book that uh, it is in the heritage of the bhikkhus to be the custodians of the people, of the welfare of the people, especially the welfare of the people of Sri Lanka. And uh, he argued that uh, in the past, uh, monks in the villages, they were the teachers, counselors, advisors, uh, settling disputes among uh, uh, the villagers. 
So they were the leaders, the true leaders of the community. And this role diminished uh, since the colonial times. And uh, eventually with modernization, this was even further eroded away. But he said, actually, the heritage of the Bikus is such that they were involved in protecting the interests, looking after the interests of the people, serving the people. So this became like a, a great source of inspiration to many political monks who like to uh, quote uh, whatever Rahula said, uh, support their involvement in politics. And in fact, uh, Rahula was, people say he was the real author behind this, the Kalania Declaration of Independence, January 6, 1947. It's here at the Declaration of the Sangha of Sri Lanka. In 1947, when the British were ready to grant uh, independence to Sri Lanka, but not a full dependence, not a full independence, but as a dominion state of uh, the British Empire, actually, some of the monks were not too happy about it. And therefore, they came up with this Karania Declaration of Independence. Uh, this one, I think you can Google and you can get full content from the, from the Google. Uh, so this is also an indication of the uh, involvement in politics uh, by monks at that time. And in fact, Rahula, subsequently the next year, 1948, he was the founder and joint secretary of Mahajana Peramuna. This is a political party. So he's one of the earliest monks to participate in the joint political party. But uh, his political parties did not succeed, he did not do well. And I think they lost most of, most of the time. So eventually he, he, he departed from politics and uh, he concentrated on uh, his Dharma study and Dharma writing. And he wrote this book, What the Buddha Taught. This book, I, I, is, is a reference book for Western Buddhists. Many Western Buddhists who would like to learn about Buddhism, especially Theravada Buddhism, would take this as a reference book. And in fact, it became like a textbook for a lot of uh, Buddhist students uh, in the West. Not a very thick book, but a very concise book that uh, presented Buddhism in a manner very much more suited to the modern mind. So he became a very well-known Buddhist scholar. So it is good to fail in politics. It's okay. If you fail in politics, you can become a good scholar. Okay. So whoever who could not get into the White House can always enter into the campuses, any campus. Then, probably because, because of that kind of a, a worldview about uh, monks in politics, a, a, a very recent phenomenon in the year 2004, it was a parliamentary election in uh, Sri Lanka. For the first time, a political party comprising solely of Buddhist monks constructed the post. And being despite the fact that they were created just two months before the elections and generating passionate debate over the appropriateness of Buddhist monks participating directly in politics, this party, the National Heritage Party or the Jataka Hela Urumaya, actually won nine seats. For the first time, nine monks went into the parliament. One of them was. Uh, Omapa Sobitatera. So 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 I think around the year 2008, when he was no more member of parliament, 
uh, he came over to Kuala Lumpur to attend activities and uh, one of the novitiate programs uh, and uh, which was actually organized by my team of people and I met him and uh, actually I also disagree with Mang's part contesting for a for us to be to for political power but uh, we did not talk about politics in fact uh, I think he was very quiet when it, when it comes to politics we were just talking about uh, manhood and novitiate programs so uh, in politics is also not too bad maybe you can become a better monk just to share a little bit more about Sri Lankan Buddhism. There is a, a uniqueness in the Sri Lankan Buddhism in the sense that Sri Lankan Buddhism not only revived itself, Sri Lankan Buddhism also uh, have, uh, has an influence uh, over the West, much bigger than the influences uh, from China. Uh, despite uh, China's uh, attempt at during Tai Chi's time, there wasn't much uh, achievement. Whereas uh, Sri Lanka uh, was much more successful. They were able to influence uh, Westerners much better. You have this monk, Nyanya Tiloka Mahatera who was born in 1878 in Germany and passed away in Colombo in 1957. He became a monk in 1903 and became a full-fledged monk in 1904. Mm -hmm. He subsequently, uh, he had one of his disciples is Yan Yan Tonic, uh, also another very famous monk. Now, this Western, early Western monk they were very uh, influential in the, uh, through their writings. The first half of the last century, Sri Lanka has a Western educated elite, and China not so. So another one is uh, this is uh, the the disciple. Now that one is the teacher, Yan Yan Tiloka, the, the the student Yan Yan Ponika. He was a German-born Sri Lankan, Odin Theravada monk. He's a German monk, co-founder of the Buddhist Publication Society, and contemporary author of numerous uh, seminar Theravada books and teacher of contemporary Western Buddhist leaders such as Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, a few a few weeks later, you will be listening to Bhikkhu Bodhi, American monk. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi actually also learn from Yan Yan Ponika. And Yan Yan Ponika learned from Yan Yan Tiloka. And Yan Yan Tiloka actually study Buddhism in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka has a good influence uh, over the West. Only a few weeks ago, I uh, appeared in the Google, uh, in the Facebook, that uh, some scholars have done some research and dug up the letters of correspondence between the David Ben-Gurion, David Ben-Gurion and this man. David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel. Okay, first Prime Minister of Israel. And in their correspondences, uh, Yan Yan Ponika first told David Ben-Gurion, I'm a German, but I'm a Jew. So he is a Jew, actually. He's a Jew. Uh, to, uh, German Jews. So that this shows the influence of uh, Buddhist, uh, uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism on the West. And one of the most important uh, influences was on uh, this uh, Professor Rice Davis. Professor Rice Davis joined the British Civil Service and came over to Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, he became very interested in Buddhism, and uh, he studied the uh, Pali text. Uh, 
the party tax becomes, and later in 1881, in the USA, he declared that he would like to uh, establish the party tax society. And the party tax society existed until today. And this party tax society, his wife uh, continued with his work, also another distinguished party scholar. These two scholars contributed a lot to uh, recent development of Buddhism. Because prior to that, many people uh, do not know very well about the Pali. And when they dug up some of the Asoka pillars uh, in, in India, they, people could not figure out what was inscribed on the stones. Then later on, people, people in Sri Lanka studied the Mahavamsa and they, they noticed from the Mahavamsa the description of those uh, uh, Asoka pillars in India and the name of uh, Piyadasi. was mentioned and later on. So from the, uh, uh, the uh, what I call the, the writings of the Mahavamsa, we were able to contribute to the, to the, to the understanding of what was uh, written on the, uh, what was inscribed on the Asoka pillars. So, the Pali Tech Society's uh, foundation is very important and today uh, one of the biggest uh, contribution was the Pali English Dictionary uh, compiled by the Pali Tech Society. So today generally in the world it is acknowledged that uh, the authority on Pali, uh, if you want to study Pali, the rightful place is in Sri Lanka. And, uh, the founder of this kind of study was Professor Rice Devi. And if you like to study Sanskrit, the rightful place would be in India. And uh, the, the founding member who started this uh, interest in Sanskrit uh, is none other than Max, Max Müller of uh, Germany. So Max Müller of Germany, famous for the Sanskrit study in India. Uh, Professor Rice Davis, famous for the Pali study in Sri Lanka. So, uh, Buddhism in Sri Lanka contributed, uh, influenced these Westerners, and uh, these Westerners, uh, through their great scholarships, in turn contributed greatly to the overall development of Buddhism. So, this is my story about uh, Sri Lanka. Okay? Very briefly about the uh, situation, the, the, the movements in Sri Lanka. Uh, not so tragic as in the case of uh, Vietnam. Uh, no, no, no lives have to be sacrificed, no violence, because unlike uh, Vietnam, uh, in which uh, The independence movement is the power, whereas uh, in Sri Lanka, there was a peaceful transfer of uh, power from the British uh, to, uh, to the Sri Lankans. Okay, I'm rather tired. Any questions? <laughs> If you ask question, then I don't have to keep on uh, is, talking away. Is the JHU yeah. party still active? Say again? Is the JHU party still active in politics? JHU party, yeah, JHU, yeah. They still have people serving uh, in it parliament? Is, it is, it huh. is. No, no, no. I think uh, after 2004 election, they got 90s, and the next election, they lost. Hmm. They lost all. And uh, in fact, they started quarreling, quarreling among themselves. So, you can't say that uh, just because you are monks, then you are more well cultivated, you have less problems. No, not, 
not so, so, not so. In fact, uh, the party uh, uh, split, split into two. Soon after that, there was a split, splinter group and another splinter group came up from the ASU. Politics, as I told you in one of my lectures, is always very divisive. So it's not that uh, because you are a, a so-called uh, holy man, then uh, a group of holy men together, you will be divided. No, not, not so so. Not like that. Even in Malaysia, the Muslim political party had uh, split many times. From one big one, split to a smaller one. The smaller one split again to the smaller one. And they all claim to be uh, you know, following the will of God. <laughs> Okay, anything else? Okay. okay. Is there, um, since yeah. you have a, a like a, a national uh, political involvement yeah. direct involvement is there also do you see a lot of the uh, of a local political involvement um, um including monks again was very chocolate. with the yeah, party yeah. that we were uh what's uh jn jnc uh are they also officers do you have monks who are uh, political officials uh locally in, in uh, like municipalities or mayors or anything like that? In Sri Lanka, you mean? That one, I'm not very sure. I'm not very sure. Okay, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'm looking, looking only at the national level, so I'm not so sure about the university, university level. Dennis, did you have a question? You unmuted your mic, so. Yeah, uh, what was Ben Guren's connection again? The Jewish uh, oh, prime minister. Oh, one, one thing. This, uh, the first uh, prime minister of Israel, Ben Gurion, uh, he was actually uh, very interested in all regions, and in particular regions of the of the Orient. So he began to ask his officers around, could you all introduce me to some scholars who are well versed in, say, Buddhism, Hinduism, and things like that. So his uh, advisors introduced him to uh, to this Reverend uh, Nyan Nyan Tonika. And uh, the correspondences show that uh, he would ask the Reverend, uh, uh, Reverend Nyan Nyan Tonika uh, for his opinions on certain things, and Nyan Nyan Tonika would reply. To him. So, in a way, uh, he was like uh, seeking advice from a Buddhist monk uh, on the several issues in life. But uh, Ben Gurion is, is still remain as a Jew. Thank you. I will be, after, after this, we'll be going to India, okay? So, you want to take a break now, or you want to go on to India first? Uh, we can take a, a break real quick if you want. Yeah. I am, at least. That's all that matters. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, we, we were in Sri Lanka the home of uh, Theravada Buddhism. Now we 
we'll move on to India, uh, where Buddhism was born. Okay. Uh, we will begin with a, a brief uh, understanding of uh, early Buddhism in India. This is the map of uh, India today. This is the neighboring country, Nepal. And this uh, dotted, red dotted area, mainly in the state of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. This was the area where the Buddha walked and preached the Dhamma for 45 years. So, uh, from the and and also in some places in the Haryana. So Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, and Bihar. This was the the. the the beginning of Buddhism, mainly around this area. In the Buddhist scriptures, it was mentioned that uh, there were times when uh, people could not see the Buddha because it seemed the Buddha had gone for a long journey. So we do not know for sure where did he go. So uh, some uh, Burmese would say that he actually walked all the way to Burma. Anyway, well, Burma is just here. Here is uh, India. Here is Bangladesh. Here is India. And here is already Burma. So if he had walked to Burma on a long journey, I'm not surprised. Just for interest sake only. And some would say uh, Sri Lanka said uh, he, had traveled, he had walked all the way to Sri Lanka. I'm also not very sure. But we know historically the area that he covered mostly was around this area, the area. Okay. Then, uh, during the Maurya period, under Emperor Ashoka, you look at the em empire of em Ashoka, it covered practically the whole of present-day India plus Afghanistan, but not the southern part of, the, uh, of India, and Sri Lanka also not included. So this is the uh, empire of, uh, of Ashoka and uh, of the Mauryan Empire. Mauryan Empire, because he was one of the kings of the Mauryan Empire. So Ashoka's period was uh, from 3021 to 1525 BCE. Then after that, we go on to the next period after the Maurya, Maurya, Maurya period, we go on to the Kushan period. Kushan period, uh, we have this famous emperor, Emperor Kaniska, who sponsored the fourth council around the year 180. Just now, when we were in Sri Lanka, we talked about the fourth council during King Patagamani, Abaya, uh, around the first century BC. So it's a bit earlier, there was a so-called, there was a fourth council in uh, Sri Lanka, mainly to record down in writing, actually writing not on papers, it was supposed to be on, on the, what you call, uh, leaves, hola leaves. Um, but that council, it seems, uh, was attended by only the people of Sri Lanka, but mainly to to, tra to transcribe the words into writing. But, uh, around the first cent first century AD, during Kaniska uh, Kaniska time, there was a fourth council, and uh, it was said that in this fourth council, actually Mahayana scriptures appeared. And it was during this period, during this Kaniska period, that Buddhism began to spread to Central Asia and China. That is because partly because if you look at the Kushan Empire, the Kushan Empire, the main green area plus the sub green area, the Kushan Empire actually stretched all this way, passed through the Hindu Kush, go into Central Asia and come into this part. Tufan, Tufan today is in China. And Kucha, I think also, uh, Kucha also today in China. So this part is, was the, 
the Kushan empires in uh, uh, what you call uh, cartridge so actually stretch until this part and therefore uh, it is in all likelihood that during the first century AD uh, it went over to China and this is the path that uh, Chen Chuan took because you can't cross the Himalayas this way you, you don't need to climb all the way up the hill and come down again to Nepal so you go through the lower area and come this way after the Kushan period, you have the Gupta period. The Gupta period, uh, from mid to late uh, third century Christian era to the uh, 543 Christian era. The Gupta emperors were Brahmins, Brahmins, but they were supportive of Buddhism. And in fact, they, they sponsored quite a number of uh, Buddhist centers, including uh, Nalanda, including Nalanda. And Pasien, who came to this area around 400, testified to the flourishing of Buddhism in India at that time, while noting the sign of decline and the progress of Hinduism. With uh, some centers neglected, while new ones were built. So Pasien's uh, description was quite uh, a very active descriptions in many parts of the Buddhist world where you find some uh, sign of decay while you also find some sign of uh, revival or flourishing. And I think this is quite normal because uh, the revival would not wipe off the so-called decline all of a sudden. So the sign of decline would be still there while the revival goes on. So this is the Gupta Empire, the Gupta Empire, the purple area. You notice that the Gupta Empire still cover the area that I show you on the first slide. This, uh, uh, which actually cover the core area of uh, the Buddha's area. Right? Where the, the Buddha's area, uh, the Uttar Pradesh and the Bihar state in India today. And this is where the Gupta emperors uh, continue to support, continue to support the, uh, the Buddhist temples. And the next period is the uh, Hash, Hasha, King Hasha period. King Hasha. Uh, he reigned from 606 to 647 AD and he was a Hindu but he converted to Mahayana Buddhism and it was during his time that uh, Shen Chuang came over to uh, India. So uh, he welcomed uh, Shen Chuang and Shen Chuang also uh, preached to him. This is in the uh, Hasha area. This empire of Hasha. Again, the same area that where, where the Buddha preached before. So that's why it was still uh, prosperous, at least in this particular area under, under Emperor Hasha. But outside, we do not so, know so much. But there is one area in the east, one area in the east, which I show in this particular area, in the bigger area, this area, oh, sorry, in the west, in the west. This area, we have another kingdom called the Maitraka dynasty. This kingdom patronized uh, Buddhism. And there's a great Buddhist center called Walabi in here. Okay. So during the 6th century AD, uh, Buddhism still survived or rather still uh, flourished in India on the, eastern, on the western side in this uh, Maitraka dynasty. And on the eastern side, at the eight original areas where the Buddha preached. And after Hasha's rule, the, the, the empires uh, broke up, and uh, they were there were many states, and they were they were. Uh, wars, fighting, and so on. So it was in a state of anarchy and many temples lost support. So because of that, 
it, it was one of the reasons for the for the decline of Buddhism. Uh, however, in Eastern India, under the patronage of the Pala Empire, he's, here is the Pala Empire. Again, the Pala Empire covers more or less the same area where the Buddha preached before. So under the Pala dynasty, uh, Nalanda received patronage. And in fact, during this period, uh, not only Nalanda was set up, but new centers like Rikamasila, Udantapuri, Jakadala, Somapuri, all around this area uh, were set up. So if you imagine Nalanda, one of the biggest, with 10,000 students, 2,000 professors, and if you were to consider another cent few centers, say Vikramasila, Orantapuri, Jakadala, Somapuri, Somapuri, and if each one of them were to have another 10,000 students, there would be, be about 50,000 monks uh, living in all those big monasteries. But uh, perhaps some of the monasteries are smaller, but uh, all these uh, mentioned monasteries are actually pretty big monasteries. So that was the uh, stage until the Hassa period. Then come the demise of Buddhism. So from the early history now, I will have to go back, go now further uh, to the demise of Buddhism in India. We need to look at the causes for the demise of Buddhism now in India in a little bit more detail. We must admit that it was actually a gradual process which ended Perhaps uh, started around 780 or 680, as uh, some people believe. But uh, in any way, it, it was a gradual process which uh, ended around the 12th century. Uh, among the causes or the reasons for the demise of Buddhism in India, number one, Buddhism had steadily lost popularity with the laity, like what I have mentioned many times before, and drive Thanks to royal patronage, only by only in the monasteries of Bihar and Bengal. So Buddhism became only just uh, uh, monastic Buddhism. Monastic Buddhism had become reclusive and lost touch with the outside world. So loss of their humanistic nature. Okay? And well endowed temples attracted the wrong people. Because when temples are so well endowed, very rich and people from poor families who like their children to receive good education would send their children to uh, temples. But those children uh, might not be interested in Buddhism at all. So it corrupts the uh, Buddhism, especially the monastic Buddhism. And this was uh, observed by Shen Chang when Shen Chang went to India, he observed that many temples, huge temples, uh, were, in his own words, very unfeedly uh, owned and hoard a large amount of grains in the stores uh, with a uh, uh, large group of uh, servants, male and female, and uh, with grains uh, rotten in the, in the store. So, you could imagine that uh, some of the monasteries were very rich because they were all very well endowed by the uh, by the rulers. Of course, the second reason for the demise of Buddhism in India was the regionalization or fragmentation of India after the end of the Gupta Empire, which led to the loss of patronage and donations. But if you lose if you lost your donations and patronage, but if the lay people uh, were still with you, they would continue to support. But because there were no lay people and we, and, uh, and we were always re depending on the uh, uh, emperor's or ruler's support, that uh, when this support uh, waned, then we, get, we got ourselves into trouble. Well, so that is that actually one of the reasons why uh, today many uh, people advocated that uh, religions and the government must be separated because uh, to rely on government support 
would eventually make the religion very weak. And the moment the religions, the government uh, could not continue the support or refuse to support, then that religion would get in trouble. The third reason, by the time of the Palas, the traditional Mahayana and Hinayana forms of Buddhism were in were imbued with tantric practices involving secret rituals and magics. Buddhism, which started off with uh, the Buddha, gradually have, uh, uh, have, to, have, have to fight with the, uh, the, the rising Hinduism and also uh, some of the local tantric practices which uh, involved uh, secret rituals and made magics and therefore as some of these things also crept into Buddhism especially when monasteries uh, became very attractive to people who may not be interested at all in Buddhism but would like to enjoy a better life in the monasteries so they might just join the monasteries but carry together the tantric practices of uh, secret rituals and magic into Buddhism. And so this corrupted Buddhism. So uh, one example, for instance, uh, Buddhist monasteries, Buddhist monast monasticism uh, required that monks must be uh, uh, celebrate, means monks uh, must not be married, must not have sexual activities. But in some of the tantric practices, uh, involve uh, sexual practices to gain so-called enlightenment through sexual intercourse. And if this kind of things uh, crept into Buddhism, then Buddhism became completely corrupted. So scholars uh, or what they call uh, intellectuals, uh, people who are uh, more uh, sincere in their uh, religious practices would distance themselves away from uh, such practices. The rise of Hindu philosophies in the subcontinent and the waning of Buddhist power and fire after the 11th century meant that Buddhism was hanged on the philosophical front as well. Uh, this means that uh, on the philosophical front, Buddhism now have to, have to compete with the uh, Hindu philosophies. And uh, with the rise of the Hindu philosophies, so with the competition, somehow or other, this would pose a challenge to Buddhism. And then later, you have these invasions of the North India by the barbarous, barbarous groups such as the, the, the Huns or the Hans, the Turko Mongols and the Persians, and consequential destruction of temples. Not only Buddhist temples, but also Hindu temples and any other temples. So, this, at the beginning, this were, they, were, they came in as uh, raiders. Uh, invaders who came in and raided the place, uh, got hold of the properties and then went back. But later on, they decided to stay for good. So the final blow was delivered when its still flourishing monastery, the last visible symbols of its existence in India, were overrun during the Muslim invasions that swept across northern India at the turn of the 13th century around 1290-1293 like that. Islamization of Bengal and demolition of Nalanda, Vikramasila and Bodanta Puri by one general Muhammad bin Bakhtiar Khatim of the Delhi Sultanate. So, uh, in general, in short, Buddhism was uh, attacked on multitude fronts, political, philosophical and moral. So the final blow uh, when uh, uh, this uh, Muhammad bin Bakhtia Kazi, a general of the Delhi Sultanate, when he uh, came into northern India, he destroyed practically everything about Buddhism and Hinduism. So this is the destruction of Nalanda. Normally we, we, we just show one case, but actually he destroyed not only Nalanda, but also Vikramasila and Udantapuri. Nalanda, as we, as we had uh, mentioned before, at its peak had 10,000 students and 2,000 teachers. 
And uh, perhaps this is the first uh, stay in institution at that time. And according to Shen Zhuang's and Fasian's record, revenues from 200 villages were assigned here. Uh, those days, government collect taxes, usually collect taxes uh, in the form of grains, uh, crops, products produced from the field. And uh, so in this case, 200 villages were assigned uh, that uh, a portion of their produce would be channeled to the temples. That's why temples are rich. Temples were sponsored by the government. Okay. So you just look at one of these, it's going to one of these. There are 10 temples. So it was a huge complex which was destroyed uh, by the Turkish invader uh, who came into 1193. Yeah? So thousands of monks being burned alive and thousands beheaded. It was described that uh, it lined up the monks and uh, told them either you accept convert or if not you will be beheaded and for those and most all the monks who just stood there uh, not uttering anything then he would ask his soldiers to cut off their heads like uh, cutting crops uh, with a stick uh, just chop off their head and because of this mass killing the rivers nearby turned red and the three multi-story building housing nine million books. One of the buildings was nine story. So you, you notice the three uh, library with nine million books were burned to the ground. And the fire went on for three months. And the smoke from the burning hung like a cloud over the low hills. So that was the magnitude of the destruction. And uh, because of that mass uh, massacre, some Buddhists escaped to Tibet or to southern India. This is a picture depicting Mahmoud uh, Ali with people's longer, and this is how they attack. Uh, just to add in a little bit of stories, so that it's not too boring for you. It seems that uh, when uh, Mahmoud Kazi, Bakhtiak Kazi came and attacked this place, he thought this was a fortress. He thought it was a fortress because it was so huge and so big and all wall up. He thought it was a fortress. So he attacked this place and then uh, he slaughtered everybody. Then later on, he discovered that uh, there were a lot of books. And uh, he tried to get people to tell him what, uh, what are those books, what were those books for. But he supported his uh, troop members, told him all those people who knew about all those books, they were already all slaughtered by you. So he got fed up and put fire and burned all of them. So the destruction of Nalanda, Hindu and Buddhist temples were desecrated, plundered, destroyed, and materials used for construction of force. The reconstruction of destroyed temples were at times permitted if they paid the yard. Uh, this is a practice during the time of Prophet Muhammad when he conquered certain areas and uh, if the people would like to continue with their old religious practices, they would have to pay a capital tax per head uh, in exchange. So this was a kind of uh, uh, discrimination uh, to the, the non-Muslims. So if you would like to to rebuild your, your destroyed temples, you may, you may do so, but uh, you have to pay an extra tax. As a historian actually recorded, it's just for information, uh, who were the sultans and the agents from what dynasty, uh, what year to what year, and what, what were the temple sites that they destroyed. For example, here, Muhammad bin Muhammad. Muhammad bin Bakhtiak Kazi, he destroyed Nalanda, Orantapuri, Pikramasila, Bisla, Hujan, Jain, Bijapur, Devagiri, Somnath, and so on. So many of these temples, some of them Hindu temples. Okay. 
So this was about the many destructions that took place in India's those days. Now we know about all these things now. We managed to pick up some of those places because of one great uh, archaeologist, Alexander Cunningham. So just to introduce him to you. Alexander Cunningham, a British, uh, working for the British government. Uh, he was the one who identified most of the Asoka pillars uh, in Borgaya, in Sarta. Uh, and how did he do it? He made reference to the book written by Shen Chang, uh, the Ta Tang Shi Yi Chi, uh, uh, record of the Western territories. So he would re make reference to the record of the territory. The record that he mentioned for how many, how many, uh, what you know, how many steps from this particular place to that particular place, you would be able to see a stupa and things like that. So with those references, he was able to pick uh, up uh, to discover those uh, real sites and uh, dug up those places. So otherwise, today you don't know where is exactly where is to be. He was one of those who discovered. So okay, what lessons can we learn from the demise of Buddhism? What can we learn? Number one, fourfold assembly is required for the survival of Buddhism. If Buddhism is only monastic Buddhism, you slaughter all the monks, that's about the end of Buddhism. They also slaughtered many Brahmins, they also slaughtered, uh, they also destroyed many Hindu temples. But Hinduism did not uh, disappear from India because there were a lot of lay Hindus millions and millions of them outside. So that's why Hinduism managed to survive in uh, India. Whereas uh, Buddhism, lay Buddhists, we can't say exactly they were no more lay Buddhists, but they were so small number that uh, they became, they, they, uh, they were easily absorbed back into Hinduism later. We also must notice that scholarly pursuit without involving the masses is risky. Most of the monks in the monasteries, they were involved in scholarly study. The five uh, body of knowledge, knowledge, five bodies of knowledge. Uh, they, were, they were busy with their study and uh, not connected with the masses. So if if Buddhism is a religion that uh, becomes uh, very academic, it's also very risky. Okay? And I added here, preserving the authenticity of the Dharma is very important. Because self-corruption, when the Dharma is corrupted or the practices, uh, or the corrupt practices crack into Buddhism, that itself would uh, distance many people from Buddhism. And, uh, uh, make Buddhism uh, die off very fast. So, uh, preserving the authenticity of the Dharma is important. Uh, we not like to see the like what happened in the past when the tantric practices of uh, black magic crept into Buddhism. Unfortunately, we also learned an important lesson here that uh, politically, political or military forces of violence is still the most destructive force. We may not like it, but that is true. Okay, so we, we need to recognize this. And we, this is just a question for us to ponder. You know, barbarianism over civilization. How do we handle this kind of things? When, when Buddhism always uh, advocates uh, peace, non-violence, uh, a civilized way of life, cultured way of life. But when we are when you are faced with the barbarianism of destruction, you actually could not survive at all. So this is a, 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 an issue that uh, we have to ponder over. Uh, is there a way out or is that there is no way out at all? Okay, so the past history of uh, of uh, Buddhism in uh, India. Now we look at the 
uh, revival of Hinduism in India after its uh, so-called uh, demise in the 12th century AD. Today, the total Buddhist population in the Indian subcontinent, uh, including excluding Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan, was about 10 million, of which 72%, 7.2% lived in Bangladesh, 92.5% in India, and 0.2% in uh, Pakistan. So today, actually, there are about 9 million Buddhists in India, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the country of a billion people. So 9 million actually is a, actually is still very small number. And today, actually, many historical sites of uh, Buddhism are located in uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan. So now we want to talk about the revival of Buddhism, mainly because of the caste uh, system. This man is Dr. Ambaker. Dr. Ambaker is said to be the, the main figure to bring about the revival of Buddhism in, in India in recent times. And this has got to do with the Indian caste system. In the Indian caste system, we are always told that there are actually four castes. But actually, they have four castes, plus one, they call it outcast, out of the caste. So the four, on top, on the very top, are the priests, with the Brahmins, we call it the academic class. Uh, the first Prime Minister of India, Nehru, supposed to be a Brahmin, this class. Okay. And below the Brahmin, the Kshatriyas, the rulers, the administrators, the warriors. So, Siddhartha Gautama was born in, into this class. And then you have the third class, Vaishyas, the artisans, the tradesmen, the farmers, the merchants, etc., etc. And then the lowest rank, the Sudras, the manual workers. Okay. These four castes are the Hindu castes. But there is one, they call it the Dalit. Sometimes they have different different names, Dalits or Moha and things like that. These are the, the street cleaners, they do all their menial tasks, uh, maybe uh, handling corpse, uh, cleaning the streets, things like that. So this is these are the, uh, low, the, the outcasts of the Dalits. And uh, Dr. Ambaker was born as a Dalit. So just to relate to you some of the story of Dr. Ambaker as a Dalit, how he suffered as an outcast or a, 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 a person with a no caste. As a schoolboy, he already knew. He already knew as a, as a, as a Dalit, he had to carry his own gunny sack to the school so that he would sit on his own gunny sack so that uh, and after he has uh, he had done with his schools when he goes go home he would have to carry along carry that gunny sack back home so he had to carry a gunny sack to the school to, to place there so that he would sit on his gunny sack then when his, when his, when his uh, school is over, he will carry that gunny set back. Other students don't have to do that. But as a Dalit, he has to do that so that his body would not contaminate the other places. And he, he was not allowed as a Dalit to open the tap for water to drink. All the other students, they would just go to the tap and open the tap for water when they feel like uh, drinking the water. But as a Dalit, he was not allowed to do so 
because uh, his hand touching the this one, then he would spoil the, the cleanliness of the water. So he would have to wait for the the school peon. Uh, the peon means the of uh, uh, the caretaker, the school caretaker to open the water for him. Then only he can put his hand up and bring the water from there. And if the school uh, caretaker was not there, then he would have no water for the day. He was used to it only. And then, uh, but as he related his life, uh, his life story, then we can appreciate uh, how the Dalit suffered in India. As a child, when he was about 10 years old, he and his brother, and another two boys, uh, the son of uh, of his elders, elder daughter, sisters. So all four boys, one day, took a train to visit their father, to uh, to visit Doctor Ambedkar's father in a place called Korikan, Kori Korikan. Uh, by the way, Doctor Ambedkar is very fortunate. Dalit, in the sense that his father was actually employed by the British Army as an army officer. So his father actually was, despite the fact that his father was a Dalit, his father was actually much well off compared with many other Dalits. So, uh, and his father was working in a place called Korea, Oregon. So, these four boys was asked to go and meet uh, Dr. Ambedkar's father in Corrigan. So, they put on their best clothing since the, their father was not a poor, person, poor guy, put on the best clothing. So, they went into the train and from the train, they traveled the train took them all the way to Corrigan and at Corrigan, when they came up from the train station, uh, according to their correspondence, the father is supposed to send an office boy to fetch them from there. But when they came out from the train, uh, no one was no one was around to fetch them to continue the journey to the father's place. So from the train station, they were they were caught there. So the train master came and asked them, uh, where, "Where are you going?" So the boy. The upper case say, yeah, we would like to go and see our father in a place called Korea Clan and so on. They said, why don't you go? They say, my our father was supposed to come and fetch us, but he's not here. Then the, the, the train master, as usual in India, the first they would like to ask you, they ask you, who are you? We need to say what class, what caste are you? So he said, this poor boy straight away answered him, I'm Moha, Moha, one of the Dalits. That means I'm a Dalit. He said straight away, the train masters, the, the station master's face changed and refused to entertain him and walk away. But uh, so about an hour or so later, the train master came back and said, okay, uh, there's a hot carriage, a, a bullock cart carriage out there. You can take the bullock cart and continue the journey. But the bullock cart, why it took almost one hour for the train master to come back and help them? The train master actually approached all the bullock cart drivers up there in the train station to fetch these four boys. But when they when they knew that these four boys were all died, none of them would like to fetch them because that would contaminate their bullock carts. They don't like to be together. The, the bullock cart drivers would not like to sit together with, uh, with, the, with the boys. So, but finally, it was agreed that uh, uh, since uh, they, have, they have some money, so a uh, baker's uh, group of boys had some money, they agreed to pay the bullock cart drivers and they would drive the bullock cart themselves. And the bullock cart driver would just walk and follow them from behind. Can you see? They were willing to, the bullock cart driver was willing to uh, sort of lease out the, 
the bullock come to you and I will just follow from behind. But you drive yourself. So that's how the journey continued. You know? So they they went on, but you but after the but actually the three hour journey turned turn out to be something like five hours, you know, in mid late into the night. And the poor bo the, the bullock cart drivers actually uh, finally after a few hours also could not stand the walk. He actually jumped into the truck and joined them actually. <laughs> okay. But all along the way, when they stopped here and there, they could not get water. Because the moment they met, they mentioned that they are tariffs, nobody would like to give them water. So they so this this uh, boy, uh, this group boy, uh, four person suffered uh, a lot along the, the, the journey until the, the next morning they arrived at the father's house. And uh, then only they realized that the father actually received the correspondence. Uh, I mean, sorry, the boys actually sent a letter to the father that uh, they are coming on such a such a time, but uh, the letter did not reach the father because the letter reached the father's uh, office boy and the office boy kept the letter. But here, you notice, even a bullock cart driver was not prepared to cooperate with him, with the group of boys, just because they were uh, from uh, the Dalit group. And another one is the worst part. Dr. R. Baker received scholarship from the from the from the Sultan or the His Majesty, one of the rulers in India, to study in the West. So he studied in the West, he studied in the USA, he made many good friends there in both in London and in the India and in USA. When he came back, he was offered a good job in the place called Baroda. When he took a train to Baroda, when he came out from the Baroda station, wanting to report to that particular place, and uh, since the government, the quarters was not ready for him, he had to find a place for lodging. And the first thing he went to that place, he went out of the station. He stood out of the station and was thinking, where, where shall I go now? The moment you are you are men mentioned that you are Dalit, no Hindu accommodation would take you. So finally, he, he found his way to, a, to an inn, not a really hotel, an inn, a lodging place run by a Parsi, Parsi, P-A-R-S-I, Persian, uh, the practitioners of fire worship, they call it fire worshippers. In India, the fire worshippers run their Persian, Persian thing. So he ended up in that Parsi thing and uh, stayed in that Parsi thing. But the moment the Parsi innkeeper knew that he was a Dalit, refused to let, to let him into the Parsi thing. Because our Parsi thing is meant for the Parsi thing, not for people who are not Parsi. So Ampeka sort of uh, negotiated with him. I will pay you in full. And I will use another name to show that I'm a Parsi, I'm not a, a Hindu or, or a Dalit. So the Parsi people finally, because of his poor business and no customers, so he relented, let him stay in. So he stayed there for about a week or so. Then suddenly one day a group of Parsi came, you know. Now they knew already there is a non-Parsi who imitated as a Parsi and stayed in that uh, inn. So they came with the clubs and sticks and all those things about to wall up the Ambaker. It's already a doctor at that time, Dr. Ambaker. So Dr. Ambaker was, was frightened and pleaded and uh, very meekly apologized and said sorry to them. And they ordered him to have to get out of this ink immediately. So, so he, he went out of the ink. He went to the park and he was wondering, where shall I go now? So he thought, where shall I go? Uh, when I was in Austria, in the USA, I had a lot of good friends. Okay, I have a good Hindu friends. That Hindu friends uh, accepted me as a, as a normal person. When we were in the USA, he was exposed to the West. So he asked his Hindu friends 
would you be able to just let me stay for a while while the waiting for the government to approve my government quarters? Then the Indian friend said, I don't mind, but if you come to my house, my servant would go away. So the public got the hint, so he did not insist that uh, his Hindu friend should help him. Then he went to his Christian friends. His Christian friends was also probably a Hindu converted to Christian. Then uh, he asked his Christian friends. Then his Christian friends said, uh, "Well, I don't mind, but uh, I have to ask my wife first." Mm -hmm. And uh, Doctor Abeke knew his wife was a Brahmin who converted to. Uh, Christians and his wife would not agree either. So finally, he, he could not find any lodging. So finally, from Baroda, he went back to Bombay. So he worked, he went to Baroda for only 11 days. He could not even find a lodging. And he came to realize Dalit is not only discriminated by the Hindus, Dalit is also discriminated by the Parsis. Okay? And then, just let me share you another story. Uh, although this uh, diploma is in the uh, in Buddhism, it is good that uh, you listen to some stories and enjoy yourself. You don't have to remember those stories. <laughs> okay. okay, another story, just to relate to you how the Dalit suffered in uh, India. He was already uh, appointed to a position to investigate the, uh, the to investigate the uh, the plight of the Dalits. So one day he went to this place called uh, Charlie's Gone. And when he arrived at the train station, he waited for an hour and nobody came. After I uh, sorry, nobody. I mean, he was asked to wait at the train station. And there were a lot of Dalits who welcomed him, but they wanted to bring him to a place about two miles away only. But uh, eventually, they came, uh, this time with, another, with, a bullock, with a horse carriage, with a horse carriage, and he was put in the horse carriage, and uh, this horse carriage would have to pass through a bridge. And uh, the, the horse carriage driver was not very good, and uh, he met with an accident. He fell down from the from the horse carriage. The whole horse carriage actually fell into the river, and he himself landed flat on the bridge. And later on, on investigation, he found out the reason why. He was waiting there for a, about an hour or so before they could arrange a carriage for him because. No horse carriage drivers was willing to carry a Dalit. So eventually, the Dalits have to make an arrangement where the Dalits would, would take over the whole horse carriage. So the horse carriage rider who took him on that day was actually not an original horse, ca horse carriage rider. He was a Dalit who, who became a an interim uh, horse uh, carriage uh, driver. That's how he met with an accident. So from that incident, he said, uh, even an ordinary horse carriage driver would look down upon a Dalit who is already a barrister and law. By the way, he's a lawyer, also an accountant, also an academist, uh, an economist. Another incident, pouring the water in the fort of Daulat Tabat. This place called Daulat Tabat, you look at the word, you know, you know it's a Malay. It's, it's, I, I, from my Malay language, I know it's a Malay language. Malay language. Daulat means a great, you know, honor. Daulat Tabat is a Muslim community, Muslim area. So there was a great uh, ancient uh, historical site there. So when he went to that place with a group of people, they wanted to enter into the fort. 
And uh, because when they came, it was all long journey, so they were all very tired uh, with dust all over the body and things like that. So they saw a fountain, a, a tank, a water tank, full of water, right to the beam. So the moment they saw the water, they straight away went there and used the water to clean up themselves, you know, wash their body, their face, and things like that. And then they started moving into the, fort the fortress. But just before they entered the fortress, there was a, a old man with white beard, a Muslim, Muslim, a Muslim clergy or Muslim ulama, shouting at the back. Why the Dalit is dirtying and polluting our water? Then after that, more and more Muslims came. All the Muslims came and surrounded them and confronted them and scolded them. Why do you dirty our water? Then the Ambika had to tell them, we are foreigners to your place here. We do not know your practice. So that's why we use your water. Then then the Muslims began to shout at the local Dalits. Why didn't you take care of these foreign Dalits? Why do you allow them to, uh, to uh, pollute the water? So eventually it was about to erupt to become a riot or even a murder. So uh, Ambika finally got lost his temper and he shouted back. Is that what your religion taught you? Is that what your religion taught you? So the, the Muslim man kept quiet. If I convert to Islam now, can I drink the water? So finally, the Islam man kept quiet. Then after that, Dr. Ambaker uh, took out a paper and, uh, and wrote down his identity. He is no small man by then, you know. He wrote down his identity and passed it to the, to the caretaker of the, the fortress. So finally, the caretaker of the fortress admitted them to the fortress and the incident was over. From that incident, Dr. Ambaker concluded that Dalits is not only an outcast to the Hindus, it is also an outcast to the Muslims. So they are outcast to the Muslims, outcast to the Parsi people, outcast even to an ordinary a horse carriage driver, uh, outcast to even the fourth class, fourth class people. So with all this bitterness in life, Dr. Ambaker embarked, embarked on his journey to, uh, to bring about uh, the, the abolishment of the caste system. So I have uh, related to, to you some of the pitiful stories of the Dali people. So it's about time now. We will stop here. Then the next lesson, we will talk about what did the Ambika do, uh, how he made use of Buddhism uh, to help uh, bring dignity back to the, uh, the Dali people. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dato. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank a, you. A lot of good Thank information you. today. <laughs> Very great lesson. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. Have a good night. Thank you.